a spectacular news week, courtesy of the U.S. Supreme Court. We examine how their decisions could change your life. Tonight on Washington Week. God bless America. I think the Supreme Court ruling yesterday was uh, not simply uh, a victory for the LGBT community. I think it was a victory for American democracy. Gay rights triumphs at the Supreme Court. Today we can go back to California and say to our own children, all four of our boys, your family is just as good as everybody else's family. But will the victory hold? With this decision, the courts have allowed the desires of adults to trump the needs of children. Every child deserves a, a mommy and a daddy. Good evening. Even if we were given to hype around this table, this week would defy any temptation to overstate. So we've assembled the smartest folks we could think of to break it all down for you. The legal reasoning, the political consequences, and the policy effect of all the big cases decided by the Supreme Court this week and this term. Edith Windsor, the plaintiff in the case that overturned the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, put her victory this way. I lived with and loved Thea Spire for more than four decades in love and joy, in sickness and in health until death did us part. When Thea died in 2009 from a heart condition, two years after we were finally married, I was heartbroken. On a deeply personal level, I felt distressed and anguished that in the eyes of my government, the woman I had loved and cared for and shared my life with was not my legal spouse but was considered to be a stranger with no relationship to me. Justice Anthony Kennedy, writing for the 5-4 to four majority, found that law, enacted in 1996, quote, undermines both the public and private significance of state-sanctioned same-sex marriages, for it tells those couples and all the world that their otherwise valid marriages are unworthy of federal recognition. Justice Antonin Scalia, writing for the minority, saw it differently. He wrote, on the majority's telling, this story is black and white. Hate your neighbor or come along with us. The truth is more complicated. So what were the complications? Starting well, with Justice please? Scalia said, would say the main complication is that not everybody who voted for the Defense of Marriage Act was motivated by animosity toward gay people, that it's more complicated than that. But two other points about this. First of all, the decision strikes down the part of the law that prevents the federal government from recognizing the validity of same-sex marriages in the states where they're permitted. But it does also create instant complications. What happens if a couple gets married in one of those states and then moves to a state where marriage is not allowed? Do they still get federal benefits? The government is trying to work that out. And secondly, it's complicated because there are parts of the ruling that can be used by both sides in this debate as it goes forward. For example, for gay rights groups, it's the language. Uh, it says same-sex marriages have dignity, a word that the author of the opinion, Anthony Kennedy, uses ten times. Uh, he says it's a legitimate personal bond that deserves uh, deep recognition. But the opponents will say, no, no, the key to the ruling is that the states get to decide what marriage is. So those are some of the complexities. But, John, the one thing that this did not do was give any kind of constitutional protection to gay marriage. It stopped well short of that. Definitely. In fact, that wasn't even the issue in that case. It was the second case involving Car California's Proposition 8, where the justices could, if they had chosen to, gone all the way and actually decided whether there should be a constitutional right to um, same-sex marriage nationwide, not just in the states that already have it. And what the court did in that case was essentially say, we're not going to decide. The challengers in the case, those who had defended Proposition 8, which everyone remembers with the 2008 ballot initiative there that defined marriage as only between a man and a woman and stopped all local efforts to actually have same-sex marriage. To, the question was, was that constitutional or not? Now, lower courts had said no. The proponents of it had come back up to the Supreme Court and said, you assess this, but the Supreme Court said by another five to four vote, different from what Pete was talking about, no, we're not going to decide. And underneath all that, first of all, one thing it did, it did something really big. It just allowed same-sex marriage to go forward in California, which in and of itself is really which, important. As we speak here tonight, 8.30, 8.40 on the East Coast, actually, they're starting marriages. Right. So that is no small thing, that California can now do it. But David Boyce and Ted Olson, the super lawyers who had brought this case to the Supreme Court, 
thought that perhaps they could win this nationwide right to uh, same-sex marriage, and the Supreme Court said, we're not going there, and frankly sent some signals that said, not for a while. Well, let's talk about the broader impact of this, because we have, we have a map up here. Let's look at all the states where same-sex marriage is already legal. California and Washington in the West, Minnesota and Iowa in the Midwest, in the Mid-Atlantic, D.C., Delaware, and Maryland, and all of New England, Connecticut, <laughs> Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. And I wonder, Amy, if you look at these, whether this means there is a groundswell that's building in all of these states already. I don't know that you're going to see a groundswell. I mean, it seems pretty clear when you look at where it's legal and where it's not. It divides also pretty well uh, uh, how people voted in the presidential election, right, or blues and our reds. And whether it was on a ballot initiative, initiative or, or whether it was by the legislative. Or but by look, a court decision. Or by, or a, by court, a court Right, in, right. Uh, in Iowa's case. But, and, and we still see, while the trend is heading towards acceptance of gay marriage, it's still pretty evenly divided. I mean, it's something like 50, 43 percent or 52, 45 percent mm -hmm. favor. The problem in terms of, you know, where it's going for opponents of this issue is that it really is older people who are the most opposed to this, as those folks sort of fade away, uh, and younger people, that's a nice <laughs> a way, polite that, way to say it, it. Right. Uh, and younger people start to move, uh, move up in age. This is just not an issue at all. But I think that, to me, is the biggest question, which is, what does happen in a state where it's not legal? Um, do, do people in that state then have to go to uh, to a court right. to get their marriage, uh, you know, thing validated. validated? Well, here's the interesting thing, Dan, which I also find, which is that the change that we're talking about from old to young, from just generation to some of the politicians we cover just a few years ago. In fact, mm -hmm. Bill Clinton signed mm -hmm. DOMA mm -hmm. in the dead of mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were against gay marriage in 2008, not that long mm -hmm. ago. They were all cheering this week. What changed? Public opinion changed. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the politicians followed, and to some extent, the court followed as well. And I think there are two political sides to this. I mean, one is the continuing effort now, state by state, that these decisions will set off, where proponents will try to change the laws, or in some cases, the state constitutions. That's a long process. I mean, the Supreme Court could have short-circuited that and chose not to, and we don't know what a future court might do, uh, but that's one fight. There's also the other side of the political fight, and that is, how does this fit into Republicans versus Democrats in political campaigns and who stands on which side? And I think even before these decisions, what you saw was that, in essence, th there had already been a tipping point in that. Um, not that long ago, Republicans saw this issue as one that was helpful to them to rally their base and certainly in the 2012 election, we saw President Obama and the Democrats, and ever since then, make it clear that they now think that the momentum of this issue is much more on their side politically. Yeah, and you don't very see interesting to look at the statement by John Boehner, because yep. the defense yeah. of the Defense of Marriage mm -hmm. Act was picked up by House Republicans after the Obama administration said, we won't defend it. What Boehner said is, not the sky is falling. He just said, well, you know, we did our part to make sure there are checks and balances and an opposite branch of government get to, gets to weigh in. I personally have my views, but it was not, uh, you know, the end of the world. It's not a call to the barricades. Yeah. Right. And what's interesting, though, is that it, there's, a, there's a majority sentiment among the public, and there's a uh, near majority coming now, both crossing over Republican and Democrat, but not majority of the states. And that's why it will ultimately come back to the Supreme Court, but because there will be some states that will just plain hold out. In the meantime, there are practical impacts. There, we saw that the Pentagon came out and said, we're going to start giving mm -hmm. benefits to uh, gay partners. And, and, and we also saw that, uh, that, 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 that in an immigration, I'm sorry, I'm going to get the words going to come out. <laughs> in immigration, there are supposed to be 36,000 couples who would be affected by this. So this diffused at least one key part of the argument in the immigration bill. Well, those are the two easy ones because that's where the law is quite clear. It's not clear on, for example, you get married in a marriage state, you move to a non-marriage state, what benefits go with you. They're trying to figure that out mm -hmm. now. Only today, the Office of Personnel Management put out the first directive that applies to federal employees and saying, now same-sex partners, we're going to recognize you for health and life insurance. Those are the easy ones. It's taxes, it's mm -hmm. veterans' benefits, it's Social Security. Some of these things may actually require an act of Congress to allow the benefits to follow uh, people to a non marriage state. How, that, that's sort how of funny, quick, isn't how it? How quickly you know, will, it, will, will any of this come back to the court? Well, I think what will happen is 
uh, a couple that go gets married, say, in Massachusetts and moves to Alabama and seeks to have its marriage recognized by the state is going to sue there. But so, so that's how the next round of court battles will start. But as Joan noted, <laughs> the, the Supreme Court was only too happy to hustle the Prop 8 case out the door. They don't want this now. And I think the, the people who because are trying to get these the rights. People, but for technical reasons, yeah. too. No, but there was, yes, for technical reasons on that, but it was a very shrewd set of votes. The 5-4 group that got rid of the Defense of Marriage Act provision splintered mm -hmm. in a way that said, suggested, and I really think this is the signal, Pete, is that even the liberals don't want to have to handle this now. They're they don't think ready. they have the votes. They there don't, are different coalitions. On it, exactly. Device. So I think that's the message. Meanwhile, the proponents, Ted Olson and David Boys and their team, are looking around for another state to bring a challenge. But that might take a couple of years, and maybe the court will be readier.